Hello, I'm Peter Morville, and I'm very pleased to be with you in all 14 locations to celebrate the first ever World Information Architecture Day. In honor of Ted Nelson, the visionary information architect who invented such wonderful words as hypertext and intertwingularity, this short talk will be a hypermedia adventure, which means I'll be jumping semi-randomly between topics and formats. And the transitions might be a little rough, so fasten your seatbelts and hang on. Today, I'd like to talk to you about three things. And no, it's not users, content, and context, though that's a good guess. Instead, I'm going to explain why it's still important to keep defining the damn thing and why cross-channel means we need to start cross-training. And how we only enhance our value by embracing our values. With the first edition of the Polar Bear book, folks complained that we hadn't provided any formal definitions of information architecture. And I remember thinking to myself, come on people, the book is the definition. To understand IA, you have to read the whole thing. Of course, being a librarian, I was too polite to say that. So for the second and third editions, we added definitions, which of course caused even more trouble because now people had something to argue about. Now I personally have very little interest in turf wars between disciplines, and I don't care about job titles on business cards. In fact, in my mind, everyone is an information architect. But I do feel compelled to keep redefining and redeframing what I do, because the context in which I practice keeps changing. For instance, while consulting at the Library of Congress, I've done a massive amount of classic IA. But I've also helped to formulate a cross-channel strategy with mobile and social components. And at Kresge, one of my challenges was helping the foundation to formulate a multi-channel communication strategy to help everyone understand the relationship between the website, social media, and more traditional communication channels, such as phone and print. On a more exotic note, Vodafone asked me to create personas and scenarios and sketch a set of user interfaces for the future of mobile search. And in my current work for Macy's, I'm thinking hard about how to improve the user experience across physical and digital channels. To stay flexible yet centered amidst all of this contextual flux, I find it useful to play with different ways of framing what I do. Sometimes I'm philosophical and oriented towards the future, while other times I rely upon simple metaphors from the past. What's exciting is that while classic IA is more important than ever, there are new challenges in web strategy and cross-channel service design and ubiquitous user experience design where information architects can make a positive impact and have a lot of fun. Of course, the challenges can be overwhelming. I mean, how can we make the complex clear? when it's hard to make sense of it ourselves. Let me try to answer that with a metaphor. So I've been a long distance runner for years and I know how to train for a marathon. You run and you run and you run. But that approach wouldn't do me much good later this year when I attempt my first half Ironman triathlon. I'll either drown in the lake or fall off my bike. For the triathlon, I have to practice sports I'm not good at and learn from others who are. And that's the only way we're going to get good at cross-channel IA. Oh, and one other thing. We have to get our heads out of our monitors because you can't really understand the pros and cons of responsive web design by simply resizing the browser while sitting on your butt.
So in the spirit of adventure, we're going to change channels once more. So hold on, and we'll be right back after the break. As I was saying, to learn how to design for mobile, we need to play with a wide variety of mobile devices in real-world contexts. We can't simply imagine ourselves into understanding. For instance, I waited a long time without buying an ebook reader, and when the iPad was announced, I thought, ha, I'm glad I didn't waste my money on a Kindle. This baby does everything. So I spent $600 on an iPad, only to realize that it's simply too heavy for reading books. So now, my kids use the iPad to play Angry Birds. And I read my books on a Kindle. It only costs $79, and I love it. I can buy ebooks from Amazon or borrow them from my public library, and there are even quite a few available for free. But there are some things I will miss about print books. For instance, my dad brought this book from England. He got it in 1964. And he gave it to me in the United States in the 1980s when I was a teenager. It's one of my favorites. And my parents gave me this book in 1977. I was eight years old. Look, there's my handwriting. You see, print books make it easy to save and share. And I worry that that's something we might lose. Which brings me to my third and final topic. When our community first came together at the inaugural Information Architecture Summit in Boston, there were academics and practitioners from diverse disciplines and backgrounds. But we all had one thing in common a prodigious amount of empathy for the user. And I believe that since that event in the year 2000, we've made great progress in the design of systems that help people to find what they need and understand what they've found. But we still have a long way to go. And so I hope that today, and during all of the World Information Architecture Days to come, that we will continue to remind ourselves that together, we can make business and the world work better and enhance our own value by staying true to our values. So, that's all from me. Thanks for your attention. And I wish you all a very happy and adventurous World Information Architecture Day.